So I've been in high school education for a long time. I never left high school. Um, and people ask sometimes, you've been doing this a long time, uh, is it different? What's different? What's the same? And, you know, there's a lot of things that have changed. And certainly technology and all that stuff has led to that. But there's been a lot of changes in my years in education. But there's m some things that have just stayed the same. And so these are some of my musings about some of those things. And I'm going to share some stories with you to hopefully help you to, to understand why I think what I do. First thing, kids are good. Not that kids are perfect. But in 35 years, what I'm going to tell you is, I believe that kids are good. And I firmly believe that the adults who vest in those kids in those schools care about kids. And I don't think that's changed in 35 years. I think those are constants. And we all want to be a part of something that's, that's meaningful. Whatever it is, whatever organizations, wherever you work, whatever it is, we want to be a part of something that's special. That we feel somehow this matters. And so what that means is we need to understand what that organization's about, how we fit in, why it matters. And so I'm going to talk to you about why I think schools matter and maybe a little bit about how it's changed because, you know, we got this technology piece now. And we got this other thing called, you know, the great knowledge being Google. So do we really need teachers anymore? Do we really need schools anymore? Can't we learn everything that we need to know academically from an online situation? So what I've always believed about schools is that our most important missions are to educate the heart and the soul of kids. The academic piece is sometimes our way into kids. But making a difference in their lives in the big picture. And so what I do is I look for the stories where I work that show me what we're doing and what matters. So the first story involves two kids, same graduating class. Let me talk to you about David and Austin. David deals with autism spectrum disorder. David is autistic. In maybe classical sense, in, in that sudden changes, sounds, unexpected things can cause David to react. Sometimes those reactions are just calming mechanisms with his hands, and sometimes it's yelling or running from a room. That's just who David is. It's who David's classmates knew that he was in all the years that they went to school with him. And one of David's classmates is Austin. Pretty much everybody at school knew who Austin was, though they may not have known Austin. They knew who he was. Matter of fact, people in our town, people in the state knew who Austin was because maybe he was the most gifted athlete in his class. Setting state records, all state this, all state that, all of those things. But what most people didn't know is that Austin's a nice kid. Not perfect, but a nice kid. So what do David and Austin have in common? Sixth period. The end of sixth period each day, David would begin a walk from our building to a local job placement that was arranged by the school to teach him some real life skills. And Austin, like a lot of our seniors, had early release. He would get in his car, and he would drive home. But on his journey home, David's and Austin's path would cross. And one day, on his own, Austin stops, rolls his window down, and asks David if he wants a ride. This isn't a major monumental thing. It's not out of the way for Austin when he goes home. And David accepts the ride, and what we find out later is a relationship is built, and day after day, David and Austin ride together. Well, the year comes to its end. And at a high school, graduation is a great day and a sad day because something's coming to an end. And so David is going to go off to his work world, and Austin's going to go off to his college world. And 
along with the rest of their classmates, they're going to part. And David's parents have a very, very difficult decision. They are so concerned about these classmates who have been very kind to their son that they do not want their son to disrupt the, the graduation ceremony. They're concerned that because of the nature of the graduation ceremony, David will react. So they make a very difficult decision. David will not participate in graduation. There were numerous students, teachers, who were not happy with that decision. But it's not their decision to make. And even after many people trying to talk to them, the reality was David will not participate in graduation. So an idea is hatched. Can we have a graduation ceremony for David? The stage is set up. The chairs are there. Could the principal and assistant principal show up? One to read the name and the other to give a short speech, just like it's going to happen three hours later. Could the school board president show up to hand him a diploma like she would to all of the other graduates a few hours later? Could David at the end of graduation throw his hat in the air like everybody else? Sure, all of those things could happen. But there's a piece missing. David's classmates. See, the journey, the community is about people and the people we share our life experiences with. Is it possible that David's classmates could come? So a few of us reached out to Austin and others said, you know, could maybe a few of you come to the graduation? It'd be really nice. And I know it's graduation morning and you guys are busy and families in town and all of that. Sure, Dr. Talcott, we'd be happy to do that. It's the least we could do. But then there's a reality piece. They're high school students. And at 5 minutes to 11, there isn't one of them in the room yet. And graduation starts at 11. And David's there with his family and the family's friends. And mom is fawning over him, helping him with his gown and making sure things are just so. And the principal keeps looking at the door. <laughs> Where are the kids? In a typical high school fashion, about two minutes before they were supposed to be there and for things to start, in they come. Student after student after student, they come to sit in the chairs three hours later that they're going to occupy themselves to graduate, to share in the graduation ceremony of their classmate, that member of their community. Their mere presence for that short time signaling the importance of that young man, and sending a message to the family of that young man, this kid matters to us. And like our high school kids do all the time after events, they go eat. And you could hear a voice. You could hear David's voice. I'm riding with Austin. I'm riding with Austin. And that's why community matters. It's all about the people. And oftentimes it's just the small one-to-one -one relationship that eventually makes things happen. But I got other stories I'd like to share, and as anybody knows, I love a microphone, so I'm going to stay here for a while. Maybe the story is about a high school senior who becomes aware of a need in a community, a bigger community aware of a need for people she doesn't even know. She becomes aware of the fact that the visitation center in Sioux Falls is running out of teddy bears. See, if, if you are a child and you go to the visitation center, that's where you go to have a supervised visit with your parents because you're not allowed to be with them alone. And that's a scary thing for a kid. And so what they have as an icebreaker is the kid comes in and there's a room full of teddy bears. And they get to grab one off the shelf and it's theirs. And they take that teddy bear and they go downstairs into the counseling room with the counselor and the, and the parents and they have their supervised visit. And when that visit's over, they take the teddy bear, put it back on the shelf until the next time they come back because that's their bear and they take it off the shelf. And this goes on time after time until hopefully the last session goes well and they're able to go home with their parents and the teddy bear goes home with them. And Katie finds out 
they're running out of teddy bears at the visitation center. Is there anything we can do about that, Dr. Telcott? I think this is a horrible thing. Katie, I agree. What do you want to do? We've got to collect some teddy bears. You're right, Katie. How are we going to do that? Well, we've got coronation. Do you think we could ask people to bring teddy bears to coronation? Katie, I think that sounds like a great idea. I said, well, we'll need a spokesman. I'll do that. I knew you would. And throughout the weeks leading up, Katie's telling the story wherever and whatever she can, and we promote it and so forth. And that night, I wish I could show you the image. From one end of the stage to the other end of the stage, teddy bear after teddy bear after teddy bear. In front of the podium that she speaks at, teddy bear. On top of the piano, stacked teddy bears. And the next day, Katie and her friends boxed up hundreds of teddy bears. And I'm sure some of those are still being used today at the visitation center. See, community isn't always the people that we know. And we don't always meet the people that will make a difference for. Sometimes um, in a school, trying to make people, you can't make people just belong. And you can't make things just work. And so if you're a teacher of special education students, your heart breaks because those kids, those kids sometimes have a hard time making connections with other kids, especially outside of school. And so a friend of yours comes to you and says, there's this Best Buddies program. It's amazing. It's all over the country. Unfortunately, it's not in South Dakota. You should look at this for your school. You pair regular education students with special needs students, and they do activities outside of the school day. Sounds like a great idea. Dr. Talcott, do you think we could do that? Amy, I'm sure we could. How do you want to do it? What do you need? You need some money? We'll talk to the student council. Need some students? Let's put it out there. We had more students volunteer. Three times as many students volunteer as we had students who needed buddies. The picture I show you is one of my favorite. I love this picture. This is, was recently in the paper just a, a few short weeks ago or a few short days ago. I want you to look at the kid with the necklace. See, at Best Buddies, they have a reveal party. The buddy... And the, student, the special education student don't know who's going to be partnered. They have no idea. So they have a party. They have balloons and gifts and all sorts of things. And they announce, so-and-so with so-and-so. And the crowd screams and they come together. This young man at that party got that necklace. It's probably 15 cents. It's a plastic whatever it is. And I'm going to tell you, as of Friday... Just yesterday, that young man has still not taken that necklace off or anything other than sleeping and taking a shower. Think it matters? You think the connection matters? And that's because a teacher who cares decided to do something because she knew that students would care. See, that hasn't changed. That's who kids are. I'm convinced of it. Now, sometimes principals have ideas. It's pretty rare. Um, and I'm not that different from most principals, believe it or not. You know, uh, there's been a lot of conversation in the last number of months about the national anthem and do you stand and don't you stand and how do you feel about that. And I'm not getting in the middle of the argument. What I want you to know is that when I hear the national anthem, I think of my father. As a matter of fact, if you were to watch me during the national anthem, you would know that at some point in the national anthem, I will close my eyes. And it's my time to remember, to visualize my dad. A few years ago, somebody came to me and said, you guys ought to participate in this honor flight thing. It's an amazing program. People help to send World War II veterans to see this relatively new memorial that has been christened in Washington, D.C. It's the kind of thing your school should be involved with. You're right. Great idea. Zip back of the brain. Gone. They bring it back to my attention. I'm a little bit of a slow learner. This honor flight thing, you really, you know what you need? You need to, you need to experience it. They have send-offs at 5.30 in the morning. Great. Yeah, they, they meet at the, at the Sioux Falls Airport at 5.30 in the morning, you know, and, and, they, and they have all these things and all of that. And I'm thinking, yep. And there it goes. 
And then fate intervenes. Shortly after midnight one night, the phone rings. If you're a high school principal, that is not a good thing. Those calls have not been kind over the years. But this time it wasn't about a student, it was about my mother. And my brother calls and says, Mom's had a heart attack. She's in the hospital. It doesn't look like she has long. Come. And we gather. And he was right. A few hours later, my mother had passed away. And my brothers and I are gathered around my mother and we're, we're sharing the last of our stories and we're preparing for what the next few days will bring. And then it's time for me to leave, to go back to my home, to tell my sons that their grandmother has passed away. And that particular morning, at about 5.30, I'm driving to my home, and on the way home, I go past the airport. And it's a send-off day. And I remember. And I pull in. And I watch people who are my parents' age. And I see the governor of our state, and I see the senators from our state sending these men and women off to see their memorial. And I go, this is us. This is absolutely what we should do. We need to remember those people in our community that have made a difference. We need to become a part. How are we going to do this? We need to send these people to see their memorial. First, we've got to find a group, and we did. Now, I can tell you that most of these men have since passed away. But these were our guys. And we vested in the life of these men. It was, we could have just written a check and said, here, here's enough for seven guys, send them. But what lesson does that teach us about community and being a part? Anybody can write a check. First, we got helmets and we passed them out at football games and we collected money. Coronation. I don't know how you do it at your school, but at our school, we let the people be escorted in by someone special to them. So for that particular year, all the queen candidates and last year's queen were escorted in by these guys, most of them in their uniforms. And they walked them in like they were walking a bride into a wedding, handing them off to the boy and all that kind of stuff. We had a class that, that studied um, America at war. And so that class each took, in groups of three or four, they took each one of these seven men and they interviewed them. They videoed the interview. They, they put together slides. And so the day before these men were to fly off to Washington, D.C., we threw them a party. And for the only second time in my 20 years at our school, we took our best band and our best chorus and they performed together a series of patriotic songs. And we showed the slides of these men when they were young and we introduced them. We showed the video clips and our kids got to meet them. And in one of my most special things, our senior class took a picture with them, connecting one generation to another generation. See, community is beyond just who you know. And schools and businesses and anything else, it's about community. It is about the people. Today you've heard story after story about people and the importance of making connections. So what I want you to think about, what's your David and Austin story? What stories, if somebody asks you to talk to them about what you do or who you're a part of or whatever it is, what's your David and Austin story? Because really, it's the David and Austin stories that day after day for 35 years make me excited to go to work. Thank you.